And now we'd like to discuss something that came out of Canada, but something that impacts people all across the Western world. We'd like to bring on our special guest, Stephen Zhu, from the National Council of Canadian Muslims to discuss a report they just released about anti-Muslim discrimination in the banking industry, how it's impacting Muslims in Canada, and how it's also a phenomenon we've seen in other countries in the West, and what can be done about this problem. Stephen, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining us. Wa alaikum salam. Thanks for having me. Hamza, happy to have you. First, Stephen, first tell us a bit about uh, yourself. You are a journalist and a writer. You focus on national security, politics, foreign affairs, and far-right extremism over the past 10 years. Tell us about your, your, your focus and NCCM for those who aren't familiar with it. Yeah, so I'm a writer, um, investigator, and um, generally an employee of the uh, National Council of Canadian Muslims, or NCCM, which is uh, the only national civil liberties and human rights organization that advocates for Canadian Muslims in, here in Canada. Um, there's also foreign policy aspects to what we do, but uh, the bulk of our work is um, advocating for Muslim rights here in Canada. Absolutely, absolutely. So tell us, Stephen, about the report you just released. I believe it is titled The Untold Story of Debanking in Canada's Muslim Community. What's the report? What did you find? Well, I think the genesis of it really um, came about during various meetings we've had um, over the past year or so, where our leadership really brought up this issue of coming across or being in conversation with our community organizations, mosques, um, education organizations, schools, and so on and so forth, all Muslim charities across Canada who always bring up this issue of having problems with uh, the major banks where they keep um, the organization's reserve funds, all the donations, uh, often in the millions of dollars. Um, primarily, uh, the issue is that a lot of these organizations have experienced uh, banks that uh, tell them to leave, essentially, within a month or two to take all their reserve funds, their donation funds, and to find a new home, essentially. And that is incredibly disruptive. Um, the banks all usually don't give any kind of detailed reasoning as to why they're doing this, except to say their Muslim client, whichever organization, charity, Muslim, mosque, uh, in this case, have uh, exceeded their quote-unquote risk tolerance or risk appetite. We can get into that a, a bit if you want, but that's generally the picture here. Yeah, tell us more because on its face, it, first of all, it sounds very, as a civil rights attorney, it sounds very familiar because this happens in America as well. Uh, you call it Muslim while banking. Um, but tell us a bit more about what the banks in Canada are saying. that It's exceeded their risk tolerance. It, my understanding is they don't go beyond that and you are just kicked out and you don't know why? And that can be incredibly frustrating. Tell us more about uh, what happens after that point, how this impacts a person who has just been deprived of their bank account without any legitimate or sufficient explanation. Yeah. So, I mean, if you just if you take a look at this issue from the personal individual standpoint, um, of course, you can't live your life in Canada or the United States without some kind of banking arrangement. Um, you probably wouldn't be able to get a job that, um, you know, employed by a company that deposits uh, your wages into a checking account. Or uh, if you have no credit history, um, you know, you need a bank to give you a credit card or, you know, some other kind of loan situation. Um, you know, a lot of Muslims don't um, indulge in that because of the interest issue. But generally speaking, I think you need a bank to get uh, to get by on a day to day basis. Now expand that into the organizational um, reality. You have mosques that collect, uh, whether it's during Ramadan or all year round, millions of dollars that they need to put somewhere. Um, or they have donations that need to be processed online. Whenever you donate to an organization online, like the Muslim charity or a humanitarian organization that works in uh, Muslim majority countries, a payment processor uh, has to process that donation in order for the organization you're donating to to receive your money. So if those donation uh, processors don't want to work with you either, which is what we've seen, if their banking partners say, you know, your Muslim client is is uh, too risky, then you're really crippled as an organization. You can't take in any money. 
Right. Absolutely. And so what what do you think is really going on here? The bank says you've exceeded our, our risk tolerance, you know, very vague language, you know, meaningless. Uh, what do you think is actually happening behind the scenes? Do you have any information or you, any speculation for that matter? What What's actually going on? Well, I think, uh, first of all, um, we have to understand that uh, in the you know, North American context or really in any context, uh, to be able to do business, to be able to put your money into a bank is not really considered a human right uh, in, from the legal perspective. That's true here in Canada. It's true in the United States. And it's considered actually a privilege for uh, people who, you know, uh, everyday retail retail people to uh, put their money in banks, even though it's it's really uh, an absolute essential and it probably is considered a human right on a broader international basis. But as far as the letter of the law is concerned, banks don't have to take your money. Banks don't have to take you on as a client, which gives them an immense amount of power, a tremendous amount of power, uh, as we know, in the financial sector on everyone's lives. This is not a news. Um, and if they want to kick you out, they can. They don't have to give any reasoning. Uh, in this case, they're kicking out Muslim organizations who they believe, um, well, I mean, what's happening really is they want to comply with anti-money laundering um, laws that are coming out of, you know, uh, uh, parliament or Congress or whatever the case may be. And they don't want to be seen as taking on clients that may be doing work, let's say, in uh, relief work in a Muslim majority country overrun by banned terrorist entities, or, you know, you may have gotten a fine from the IRS or the CRA here in Canada, Canadian Revenue Agency that uh, audits everybody or that kind of thing. And if they don't want to do that, they don't have to do it. And they don't have to tell the mosques or whoever they're kicking out why they're kicking them out. They just don't have to do any of that. Do you think that there there is any redress whatsoever? For example, if a whistleblower inside a bank was able to provide evidence that these entities are being targeted not because of the work they do, well, because of because of the not because they're doing anything wrong, but simply because they are Muslim, because they're advocating for certain human rights causes. Is there anything in Canadian law that would then allow an organization uh, to take action if if there was evidence they were being targeted simply because they're a mosque? or because they're advocating for I don't know, Palestinian human rights or, or Uyghurs or what have you? Well, first of all, um, from our report, from my research, uh, we have to be very careful. There is no concrete evidence that Muslim organizations are getting this kind of treatment, are being asked to take their money elsewhere by the major banks, that the reasoning behind it has anything to do necessarily with anti-Muslim discrimination or racist discrimination or Islamophobia per se. Now, functionally, I think Muslim organizations, because there is this regime in place right now in Canada where anti-Muslim, anti-money laundering laws are in place, uh, banks are very, very, uh, any financial organization, but particularly banks that take on so many organizations, so many clients, they want to be very, very careful in terms of who they take on. Uh, They want to go through everyone with a fine tooth comb. Um, and when you talk about anti-money laundering, you're talking about criminals, and you're talking about terrorists. And when you think about terrorists still in the post 9-11 world, we think about Muslims. And the, these businesses, these banks are businesses, they're going to be looking at their Muslim clients with very, very microscopic kind of um, scrutiny. And if they see anything, if they even smell anything that's off, they'll tell, probably think about telling you to leave, if not tell you to leave. The law does not uh, require that they tell you why. They can say, make up whatever reason. Is there recourse? Is there redress? There is no redress, really. You just have to find somewhere else. Maybe you have to go to um, a credit union. And sometimes these mosques mosques or uh, Muslim charities can't even get big credit unions to take them on. They have to go to smaller credit unions. It's a very crippling thing. And what we're asking is for some kind of uh, structural change here for people to get redress, but to, to have some kind of due process in place that balances this uh, kind of unequal relationship between very powerful financial institutions and services and the Muslim organizations and any people or organizations that have to bank.
Yeah, because it seems that if a bank is uh, singling out and giving Muslim institutions particularly heightened scrutiny, simply because they're Muslim, and then enforcing, uh, sub, you know, uh, supposed uh, risk concerns on them that they wouldn't necessarily do with uh, other entities, it seems like that could be illegal discrimination, at least uh, here. So your suggestion is that uh, there needs to be some structural legal change to address this problem, to give people and organizations the potential for redress and to make sure that banks aren't doing this in the future. So that going to require laws in parliament, actions by the government. Um, how would that work in Canada? Well, I mean, the, the report is called um, the untold story because nobody wants to talk about it because Muslim charities who are under extreme scrutiny already don't want bad press, more bad press to, uh, you know, to, to come out about them. And then they'll get debanked again and again and again, which has happened. Um, so, I mean, uh, you know, these organizations, these these banks, these financial services, they're trying to comply with the law. They're trying to not lose money, not get fined by the government for, you know, inadvertently, accidentally, unknowingly helping criminals and terrorists launder money. I understand that. That is in and of itself nothing to do with Islamophobia. It's perfectly legitimate. In fact, probably a positive thing for any society to have. But if that uh, process of scrutiny and that kind of thing, you know, starts to affect uh, Muslim organizations or any community organizations in a way where there's absolutely no redress whatsoever, well, that's just an unequal relationship that needs to be changed. Is that going to be a law thing? Well, it has to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of um, industry changes. Um, again, we're just starting to talk about this, so it's unclear what that might look like. But every bank uh, assesses risk when it comes to certain clients. They probably, my guess is they assess Muslim clients, Muslim charities uh, who you know, may or may not have gotten fined by some government agency in the past. They, they assess these clients, Muslim clients, very closely, very closely. And that process should be more transparent. If you have reasons why you're kicking someone out, you should be able to present it. You should have to present it, in my opinion, just as a matter of ethics. And there should be some kind of neutral body where that evidence is assessed. And if it's true, then you should, you know, if you need, want to be kicked, if you want to kick someone out that's uh you know they're they should For be good reason then you know by all means that's your right as a company yeah yeah but the key thing is you've got to know why they're doing it because if they want to explain why they're doing it it could be a discriminatory motive uh and you wouldn't know because they're hiding it right and the only way to know is if they can proffer a legitimate explanation in the absence of one it raises questions is there one at all well, see, well, that's really the first step to addressing this is just identifying the problem which it sounds like your report does where can people read the report uh, you can read the report uh, on our NCCM Medium page. That's nccm.medium.com. Uh, and, you know, I've written also a uh, summation, a summary, a kind of like an executive summary of what I found um, in a more accessible way. You can read that uh, on the Toronto Star. Uh, it's Canada's largest newspaper. Uh, I've written a, an opinion piece about that. Um, and in the report, um, I also interview uh, a, a person who does sanctions analysis and um, for a major bank here in Canada. And he goes into some of the process of how risk assessment is done. And it's exactly as you said, we have to start naming this issue first and then get into the accountability aspect, uh, whether that's government relations, lobbying, or what have you. Uh, you know, people need to feel comfortable with talking about this first. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Stephen, for, for coming on. This is an issue that is not only impacting Canadian Muslims, but I know American Muslims as well, and possibly others in other countries. So uh, raising awareness is an important first step. We thank you for joining us to do that today. Uh, may Allah protect you and all the, the Muslims uh, in Canada. And we hope to have you back soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.